Good morning and welcome to the latest edition of Breakfast at UM Health. And today I have the pleasure of sharing some of the work done by the uh, faculty Biobank with um, the rest of Warga faculty and, 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 and beyond to try and tell you what or how the Biobank has uh, tried to help researchers uh, perform their various research projects and in so doing um, help to increase the output of uh, research from our university. So uh, without, further, without further ado, uh, I'd like to uh, start off um, with a little background on the biobank and this will be followed by um, a session um, by Encik Shafiq Saleh, who is the Biobank Manager, he will be showing a video uh, where you can get a, a virtual tour of the facility. Then this will be followed by um, a feedback or a point of view from one of our more active uh, users, Associate Professor Vairavan, who is a neurosurgeon and a researcher into the neurosciences, and then followed by a Q&A. So if I can just share my slides. So a little bit about the history of um, the biobank. It started off as a cancer biorepository unit. And this was back uh, about a decade ago. At that time, um, this was the, the idea of having a, a biorepository for tissues was mooted by uh, people who were the individuals who were working very uh, actively in breast cancer research. So at that time, uh, Prof. Hip Cheng Ha was the, was the head of breast cancer unit and working closely with uh, Prof. Teo Su Huang of CARIF, now Cancer Research Malaysia. They had approached the, the Deputy Dean of Research as well as our Provost, Tupan Aisha Ong, to try and uh, see how they can um, collect as well as uh, create this, this huge uh, library of um, or collection of cells and tissues. This was, um, this idea was then mooted to Prof, was escalated to Prof, uh, sorry, uh, Tan Sri Gau Jasmun, who was the VC at that time, who then, uh, decided that yes, it is important uh, to support the breast cancer research in that manner and uh, allocated some budget for this. So it was a one off special funding. The internal, it, the money was UM money. And uh, this was the amount that was allocated. And originally, it was mainly for breast cancer projects. Uh, later, it was expanded to develop, uh, to, to include the other tissue types. So thus the uh, biobank was put under the UM Cancer Research Institute um, oversight. So, so with the budget, um, the basic biobank equipment was purchased. This included liquid nitrogen tanks, um, um, benchtop instruments and, and freezers. Uh, but there were only two freezers at that time. And it was, as I said, mainly focusing on cancer, cancer tissue and cancer projects. Um, of course, to get to, to do this, uh, there was a lot of uh, groundwork to lay, um, forms to be filled, and um, we had to apply for ethics approval. And not only that, there was a mechanism on how and uh, the tech tissues were going to be donated to Biobank and as well as so-called ownership. So the, the procedure would be at that time, the surgeon informs the Biobank team and then the surgeon would get the patient's consent and then the team would go into OT operation data to collect sample and brings it back to a biobank for processing. So uh, this will be shown to you in greater detail uh, via the video and explained by Encik Shafiq. But basically, um, tissue was 
kept in uh, liquid nitrogen tanks. And <clears throat> for those doing proteomic work, the plasma fraction was, was extracted from patient's blood and that was uh, kept frozen in our minus 80 freezer. Uh, however, as Biobank grew, there was also um, need from other teams which were outside of, outside of cancer. And uh, this included people doing public health, et cetera, uh, uh, or, or those who were doing basic science. They were not particularly related to cancer. And so the biobank had to shift and change a little bit its form to try and serve the greater um, number of researchers rather than those who were just uh, related to doing cancer projects. So at a faculty meeting in April 2012, the biobank was redesignated as a unit and rebranded. And um, up to June 2016, we were operating at three different sites. There is no separate biobank building per se, but it was built upon, and this is uh, one of the realities, where if you wait for a special building or structure to be made for a certain uh, project, it may take many, many years. But in, in um, reutilizing or repurposing various areas, then, such a, such a unit uh, can come to existence. So uh, scattered all over the place, but importantly, it is functional. So after 2016, uh, in a effort mooted mainly by the people working in social preventive medicine. So um, during the, the heyday of um, the high impact research where there was a lot of funding, the public, uh, the S people from SPM had, had embarked on a large project related to public health, uh, metabolic disease, etc. And there was a large repository of um, plasma, etc. But the problem with keeping these uh, samples in minus 80 freezers located at the different uh, departments is that the power supply in uh, the faculty is not stable. So the pressure samples were at risk at any given day when the electrical supply is cut off that uh, years and years of pressure samples collected may just uh, be spoiled. So this time around uh, with, with the the vision of Prof Awang who was at that time the Timbalan Knight Chancellor Research. So uh, another allocation was given to Biobank and um, 20 units of, of set minus 80 freezers were, were purchased on top of renovating the ground floor of Block M. For those who were previously from UM, you'll know that this was uh, uh, surau, but largely unused and quite dingy and dirty. So it's uh, perfect to be used to keep uh, freezers. To overcome the problem of um, unstable electric supply in the faculty, uh, three layers of power backup was incorporated into this facility. Uh, and and Chik Shafiq will will show you exactly uh, the mechanisms that are put in place to ensure that the samples kept here are safe. Now the future directions of Biobank. At the start, it um, and, and this has been a, a matter of debate because at the start it was supposed to the vision was to create this huge repository or tumor tissue, anybody who wants, wants to do HD doesn't have to wait three or four years collecting samples. And also there are also cases where students are unable to graduate on time because uh, they cannot get adequate samples to run their experiments. So that was the vision. 
uh, collect cells and tissues, create a large tumor, uh, a tissue repository on top of that, create a situation where we could participate in a more commercial, um, uh, um, operate as a commercial entity where, not to say we sell the tissues, but we sell the service. But that would only be achievable if we had a lot of uh, storage space and more importantly, the ability to sustain ourselves or to generate enough income. But sometimes reality and what we can achieve are two different things. Now, I'm just showing um, a biobank um, at Stanford where you can see this huge, very beautiful building. And it also houses a center for stem cell research and education. There's a lot of endowment money there and, and therefore it can sustain itself. Or like the Victorian Cancer Biobank, it is not for profit, but if any researcher wants to uh, avail themselves of the biospecimens, there is a, a fee. And you can see that the fee is uh, not cheap, but, but this is how uh, a biobank needs to sustain itself. So even as it is, we, we uh, receive, uh, we don't have any form of uh, budget from the university anymore, for, and it's, that's been the case for many years. And salary has been a huge, uh, has eaten hugely into the biobank uh, savings. Fortunately, Encik Shafiq has moved to uh, receiving a UM salary instead of being paid by biobank exactly. And the, the MLTs that were previously there have now um, moved on. We have now shared MLTs who are also UM salaried. So that with that, we, we are just uh, breaking even to try and keep Biobank afloat. So these are some of the issues uh, faced in wanting to dream big, but the reality is we've got only two liquid nitrogen tanks uh, and both of them, and they are near capacity at 95% full and uh, the freezer space, 20 freezers only, and with uh, and the 16 are already full. So we have had to uh, tweak the vision into uh, collecting tissues according to researcher needs, more uh, focused and more um, realistic to the uh, uh, infrastructure that we have and the amount of uh, money that we that we get so um, I I hope with um, despite the the various challenges we have we will still be able to uh, assist researchers in in um, doing their research projects and I hope Viravan will be able to share with other people who, who are thinking about where they can get support uh, and, and follow his lead. So, of course, there are some charges and this is uh, cheapest in the whole of Malaysia, I think, uh, for the cryo vials. Uh, uh, sorry, for the, for the freezer. We, we are very, very limited with the space for our liquid nitrogen tanks but we, will, we are trying to negotiate with the people who already have tissues there about redundant uh, samples and whether this can be reduced. So, uh, so now I'd like to hand over to Encik Shafiq, who is one of our longest and most loyal uh, uh, servants of Biobank, uh, receiving all the calls from everybody. So, over to you, Shafiq. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank, thank you, Prohani, for the explanation on the background of uh, Biobank Uni. So today, I'm just going to showcase you guys a, a video that will show uh, this kind of service that Biobank offered and what kind of facilities that we have. 
So uh, if you have any question after the video, then maybe you can put in the Q and A. Okay, just as you know, uh, biobank need a sustainability. I mean, something that 
we can uh, do to sustain our service, uh, our unit. So what we do is we offer this service so that we can get some income in order to sustain. So uh, for the freezer storage service, the your user can use our services uh, at the rate of uh, three ringgit per box per month, and the minimum is uh, one box per one month. I mean, you can you can store with, with uh, in our freezers. Uh, doesn't matter how many boxes that you have. So if you have a larger size of samples, then maybe you can opt to choose uh, a larger compartment or maybe. Uh, you can choose within uh, the size. If you want a uh, larger size, then you can uh, choose the size A, and if you want small one, then you can choose the size B. So our freezer also come with or without rack. Should you need uh, a rack to go with uh, your uh, storage. So in order to use our service, you can drop us an email. Then we can we will send you a request form. And then you, uh, and then we send you a quotation on uh, how much the charge is going to be. And then, as for the, sorry, as for the histology services, we are charging the Turing gate per sample. And as for the, the uh, one sample, uh, we will give you one FFAP block and then one HE slides. But for additional slides, uh, we will charge extra. And you can send us the samples in a formalin, formalin bottle. So uh, this, the service that we offer is uh, NHE slides and IHC card slides. So the IHC card slide, we will just uh, cut to you in the Super Plus. plus uh, slide so that you can do your IHC later. So this is uh, the contact number. So if you have any question or if you have uh, any request, you can drop us an email at the biobank at um.edu.my and this is the phone number. Or maybe you can drop your email, uh, you can drop your request to my email also. This is the number. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff. Thank you. Okay. So, um, can, if I can just uh, address some of the questions, uh, also open to, to both uh, Shafiq, if you want to answer as well. Yes, what is, okay. So, some questions. What is the cost of maintenance of a biobank of UM size? Um, the, it's not cheap. The large, the larger, in fact, the larger uh, contributor to the largest contributor to uh, not to say contribute, which contributes to the loss of our budget is salaries. We used to pay up to ninety five get for a, a year for salaries, but as I said, um, that has largely been absorbed by this this uh, research our workers, uh, our staff being paid by UM. The, the electricity bill is 55,000 a month. So, uh, so but, but these are all factored in by some subsidized by UM and then that's how we came to the cost of three ringgit uh, per box. So, um, of course, the overheads of the, the air conditioning, the, the what is this, uh, and the maintenance of equipment, etc. So, so, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a round figure, um, but it to, to if we were we didn't have any form of support from UM in terms of subsidizing the electricity costs, salaries of the of the staff, then we would need, I would think, at least uh, two to three hundred thousand a year. Um, how much is the cost if? If the biobank, uh, if the samples are from external, we have been advised by this time. This this cost was uh, determined by Prof Sada when we first were setting this biobank facility up. Uh, in terms of the freezer facility, three ringgit per uh, per box for UM, 
and double or triple that or 10 ringgit because that is the going rate for most other storage facilities in uh, in the country. Uh, Prof. IK has asked whether the biobank has suffered any setbacks with power supply and the answer is no. We have had uh, situations where the faculty has uh, had no uh, had cut back a uh, 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 blackout, but the systems have all kicked in. Uh, the diesel, the diesel can run uh, for first. We there is there is the UPS that, or maybe Shafiq, you can explain this UPS. Uh, the, the diesel can run for about eight hours. So far, we have been going to set back for around four, maybe five hours after that, the JPPHB will, uh, will fix the power, power cut. Usually it's not more than five hours. So our backup generator can should, should last more than the time that they need to fix the uh, power cut. So, so we've had the, we have the UPS, which is a battery powered, and then uh, followed by the diesel run generator. Uh, and the diesel will only dry up after eight hours. But as Shafiq says, JPPHB has always come to rescue us by four, by four or five hours. But even let's say we are in the middle of a great uh, apocalypse or something, then uh, there's also the CO2. So yeah, yeah. The, the, CO, the CO2 tank as, as, as a last backup. Uh, so so and, and the good thing about keeping things in a freezer is that if you don't open the freezer, the temperature drops very, very slowly. And in fact, uh, it can, it can uh, the samples will not, like uh, RNA samples will not deteriorate so quickly if the temperature drops to 50, 50 minus 50 even. So uh, that's one of the things. If, if there is a power back uh, shortage, don't go and rush and so-called rescue your samples. You may be doing a bigger disservice by opening the freezer door. Uh, so, and, and just to also reassure Prof. YK, even during the long festivals like Haraya, Chinese New Year, uh, there is always a person that is on standby uh, from Biobank should the alarm go off uh, and the samples will be attended to. Uh, from anonymous, what are the tissue types that can be stored? Um, tissue, as in uh, tissue. Um, but into the liquid nitrogen, which is uh, minus 136. But the problem with that, as I told you, we have a space shortage. We are at 95% capacity unless there is a, a need for us to invest in yet another tank. We actually have two tanks, but the, the second tank is uh, used to keep HIV-related samples. So we don't want to mix um, our samples with samples which may have a, a infectious um, connotation. Mix up of tissues, almost, in fact, happen. Um, the reason is because there is uh, several layers of checking and a person cannot open their they are, they are um, uh, freezer just by themselves. They are always accompanied and there's always a sort of a two-person check. Sort of like giving uh, dangerous drugs on the ward. There will always be two people checking the, the taking out and putting back in. And, and nobody can just open another freezer because they are all locked as shown in the video just now. And to even to take the key, uh, the biobank person will be accompanying you. Okay, prion disease. I, I think I'll leave that to, to Prof. Irvin as the neuroscientist to answer. Uh, how do you isolate tissues? Is it possible contagion like prion from brain tissue? Hmm. So, and oh, the dean has now said, can you meet with FOM? Uh oh, it's always a bad thing when suddenly the dean says, come and see me. It gives me. Uh, throw back to my school days when the headmistress says, come to my office. So, okay, anyway, Vai, do you want to answer that question about Prion? 
Prof. Ani, that's a difficult question for me as well. Uh, I'm not sure. I thought we don't deal with uh, in highly infectious uh, tissue samples within Biobank. I thought that was supposed to go to the you know, uh, uh, WHO grade three labs or something like that. So I'm not sure. I, I don't know whether we have actually stored anything of that sort at all. I mean, um, I so that's why the tanks, we have two tanks, as I said, one is HIV samples, they don't, don't mix with the cancer samples. And of course, who's to know that one of the samples that Viravan has collected is someone with uh, Kruzfell Jacob, who yes. has eaten something in England many years ago. I, I, we don't know. Um, but nevertheless, um, let us listen to um, Prof. Viravan's experience with using Biobank. And hopefully that can shed some light to some of the questions here. So over to you, um, Vai. So thank you very much, uh, Prof. Hani. Um, I'm actually uh, going to be sharing my experience as a long time user of uh, the Biobank facilities. I've been using it for now six years. Um, but that said, uh, despite using it for six years, I, I realized I know very little about uh, what the Biobank is about uh, because I've learned quite a lot from uh, Inche Shafiq and uh, Prof. Hani today. Uh, so I'm actually going to be talking on uh, as a representative of uh, two of the research groups I work with, uh, the Traumatic Brain Injury Research Group, which, has, uh, which was started quite some time ago, and that was my first experience with the Biobank, and subsequently the Glyma Research Group, with which I'm, I'm doing quite a bit of work uh, storing tissues in the Biobank currently. Um, the first project where I actually got introduced to uh, the Biobank repository was in 2015 when we were actually doing a project on traumatic brain injury, we were collecting blood samples and we didn't really know how to store them, uh, how to post-process them and store them safely uh, because we had to collect uh, all the samples together at least uh, a decent number before we actually process them. And so uh, that's when Biobank came in and uh, this allowed us to store the blood samples very adequately. And uh, it actually, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we, we actually, uh, out of that project, we had uh, about two uh, tissue, blood tissue, blood uh, samples related uh, high impact papers uh, produced out of that. Subsequently, in 2015, uh, I also did some work with uh, Prof. Aisha on uh, metastatic brain tumor. Uh, as you know, breast, the breast uh, unit has been, uh, was one of the first founding uh, uh, clinical units uh, which was involved in uh, Biobank. And uh, Prof. Aisha uh, told me that she had a huge sample of uh, breast tissue. And uh, uh, we were wondering whether uh, these patients uh, who have got a brain mats from the same similar breast tissue, if we compare the tissues, would they make a difference? And this was one of the big uses of Biobank because the breast tissue was already stored you know, from about four or five years ago. And subsequently, when the patient comes back at a brain mats, we could comp uh, uh, compare both the tissue samples. Again, uh, this uh, led us to have a very high impact uh, uh, tier one paper in general pathology. This was somewhere in 2017, 2018, uh, based on the uh, tissues we collected. Uh, and subsequently in 2017, uh, we started a Glyma research group, uh, which has done a number of, I mean, we've been collecting samples on Glyma tissues since 2017. And we've got a big uh, repository of uh, Glyma tissue currently, uh, basically doing lipidomic and proteomic profilings uh, of uh, these cells. Uh, it is still a work in progress, uh, but uh, based on the tissue we have collected, we think uh, there is quite a lot of potential uh, work we can come out of this. So I'll just talk very briefly about uh, how as a clinician, as a surgeon, uh, I deal with uh, the uh, biobank itself. And that's it, before I start, I have to uh, uh, say, uh, H.S. Shafiq, uh, who were presented prior to me, uh, has been very, very helpful. And uh, he's been a, a very important resource for Biobank. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the reasons why the Biobank works very efficiently. Uh, I, I think I have to mention that. So basically what happens is prior to starting uh, uh, the sample collection itself, we have to make sure that uh, uh, we already have got ethics approval, as well as uh, we have to fill up a sample procurement request from the... Uh, uh, from the uh, biobank. And once that is done and the application has been approved, we can actually start the sample collection. 
Uh, and in, in when we are collecting a sample, we have to uh, we have to take into account that uh, uh, they they have got limited technicians. So we have to inform the biobank early. You can't have a patient on table. Uh, and then call up Biobank and expect them to come and pick it up. I mean, they don't work just for one, one person alone. So we have to inform them early. Usually what I do is I inform them about uh, a week earlier, uh, uh, roughly, about uh, what happens uh, when, when I'm having a patient. Of course, you know, uh, just like in any other cases, the surgery can be postponed, the timing can be different. So usually we, uh, we will uh, re-inform them again on the morning of the surgery, exactly what time the uh, surgery is going to be uh, happening and what time we expect the sample specimen to come out. Um, when we send in the uh, uh, information, you have to tell the uh, uh, biobank technician which operation theater you're doing it in. Uh, is it in uh, OT, which specific OT uh, or in some specific uh, lab? Uh, you also have to tell the approximate time of the procedure and the approximate time where you expect the specimen to be out. Uh, I'll, I'll go into detail a little bit later about why this is very important. Uh, on the day of operation itself, as I said earlier, we have to reinform the biobank, uh, usually in the morning, uh, either by phone or uh, usually I, I just WhatsApp uh, into Shafiq. Uh, and uh, then the biobank uh, technician will have to bring in the appropriate uh, tools. Uh, and uh, I will go through the rest of the steps in my picture later. So. In this case, uh, I, I deal with a lot of uh, brain tumor specimens. And usually in, in OT, once the uh, brain tumor specimen is re ready to come out, uh, I, I will give, uh, I'll ask one of the uh, uh, nurses or my uh, 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 RA to uh, call up uh, in Shafiq because the issue here is ischemic time. Once the specimen is out, it needs to get into the uh, sample collection tubes immediately. The shorter the time, the better the yield. And so I, I need to have Inche Shafiq in OT. And sometimes he has uh, come in and waited half an hour, one hour, up to two hours, uh, because uh, despite us uh, thinking uh, we're going to get the specimens out quickly, it takes a bit of time. So once the specimen is out, uh, it is then uh, cut, immediately cut into small pieces, usually fragments of about one by two centimeters. Uh, and these fragments, yeah, so uh, these fragments are then put into the cryo tubes. So the cryo tubes and uh, the uh, formalin, uh, formalin uh, bottles must be available uh, and ready prior to us uh, cutting up the samples and uh, as well as the vapor shipper and uh, liquid nitrogen transporter. So once that's ready, uh, I, I cut these pieces up, like I said, about one by two centimeters and then put them into the cryo tubes. And uh, these are uh, then packed within the uh, vapor shipper. Uh, and Sorry, let me go on. And, and, and very, very important uh, point to remember here is the sample collection variables, uh, which will impact the quality of the gene and protein expression. Uh, you, you have to try to get the more viable specimen as opposed to necrotic specimen. Uh, and if we, uh, you know, uh, the fresh bleeding, uh, freshly bleeding specimen, which, um, uh, because Tumors, we tend to have a lot of necrotic tissue in the center. And if you send that and uh, you later uh, uh, look at the uh, pro process sample and find there's no uh, actual RNA or DNA fragments, that's probably because of the uh, non-viable sample itself. Similarly, ischemia time. Ischemia time is the time from when uh, we have uh, cut the sample and taken it out. So that's when the ischemia time sta uh, starts. And the longer the ischemia time, the poorer the quality of the specimen. So we do what is called snap raising. So Inche Shafi is already waiting in the OT. I cut the specimen. Immediately I come out, I cut it into small pieces and it's put into the cryo tube. The whole process takes about two to three minutes. Uh, anything longer, I think the, uh, the quality of the yield is actually going to be dropping. Similarly, the temperature during sample transport. This is a very, very important uh, uh, point in that the uh, cryo tubes must be transported in liquid nitrogen. We might think from OT to the biobank is what, about uh, 200 meters. It's not really a big deal. We can send it off in a uh, normal tube, but it actually matters a lot. That little bit of time actually contributes significantly to the degradation of the tissue itself. So these are the important points as clinicians we have to remember uh, when we are doing the sample collection itself. Uh, I, I, uh, the question earlier from Anonymous was actually me, Profani, because I just wanted to know, uh, I, so far I've only done tissues and uh, brain tissues and blood. 
I do want to know if you actually can uh, store CSF samples, urine, uh, and all the other variable, various uh, uh, blood, um, bodily tissues. Uh, and that, 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 that was my question. But so far, what I've done is tissues within cryotubes and formalin, as well as blood within heparin tubes and plain tubes. And these are easily done in their uh, biobank. Uh, I, I actually asked my uh, RAs for some feedback about the biobank uh, repository because so far I've had about uh, four RAs who have worked with the biobank and all of them generally uh, agree that it is, uh, biobank gives us very good service. Uh, it's very easy to communicate with them. They're very helpful and cooperative. I think this applies to Inche Shafiq. Uh, and this is despite the odd hours and last minute changes in sample collection time. They've got a very organized storage system, including barcoding and easy access. Uh, this is to answer Prof. Uh, YK's uh, question, because the barcoding actually makes a big difference uh, in, in, in making sure we don't uh, uh, mistake samples or misplace samples or, uh, or uh, you know, even within the same box, we can misplace and uh, misread samples. Uh, they've got a very good database, uh, including the number of cryotubes and blood vials left within that specific sample. Uh, of course, there are problems. There is a little, a small bit of difficulty accessing biobank services after office hours. Uh, and this is mainly due to the specimen collection itself. I mean, we, uh, we, we can't expect biobank uh, technicians to be available at odd hours at uh, 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night and wait for hours just for one or two specimens. So there is a little bit of difficulty there. Uh, and this one was so from one of my RAs about availability of dry ice machine which will make the sample retrieval smooth. I'm not really sure about this because uh, this is usually done by my RAs, but I thought I'd put it up here uh, for Prokhani to explain if there is anything. Uh, this is a sample of the database uh, they provide us. So we can, uh, we, what we usually do is every six months or so, I write into Inche Shafiq and I ask him, what are, the, um, uh, uh, what are the tissues I have available under my account? And then this is a truncated uh, form uh, because I've uh, taken away the uh, personal identifiers of the patient. Um, but basically, he'll give us everything from personal identifier, uh, the uh, age, the sex, uh, uh, and then the date of collection, the type of tissue, and how many tissues are available. Is it cryotubes? Is it formalized specimen? Is it blood uh, vials? So it's a very uh, detailed database which will be uh, produced from the biobank, which actually helps us keep track of uh, the, the, the tissues uh, collections we do. So uh, this is my final slide. I think tissue banking in a clinical setting is very, very crucial for research and high quality samples are necessary for identification and validation of potential biomarkers and uh, therapeutic targets. Uh, a well-functioning biobank rep repository is very important for continued improvement, uh, both from a clinical point of view and uh, as well as very importantly from a research point of view. Uh, and I, I think the biobank so far has helped me uh, with at least three of my projects. And uh, out of that, we have come up with at least five papers related to tissues stored in, within the biobank. And I'm pretty sure I can do a lot more work. Uh, even the trauma research group, which we had uh, quite a while ago, I still have got some blood specimens and things like that left, which means I can go back and look at it. So there is quite a lot of work I can do with uh, what uh, uh, services Biobank has provided us. And for that, I'm, I'm very grateful to Prof. Hani and team for organizing and continuing to keep this up. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Vairabhan. Um, we'll, uh, okay. So this is where we're into our last stretch of today's uh, breakfast at UM Health. And we will um, spend the next 10 minutes or so answering questions. So, um, yes, so um, we, let me just answer the two points um, brought up by uh, Prof. Vairavan. One is about after office hours. So this is um, unfortunately a new, a new but sort of bad development because we, we lost our two MLTs who were previously uh, salaried on the biobank budget. So because, because they don't have to follow strictly UM uh, clock in, clock out um, reg regulations, we could do something like, okay, if you, if you stay back until whatever time, 
uh, then tomorrow morning you you can come in only at noon something like that so um, i do remember some of the uh, brain tumor specimens taken by prof damendra were on patients um, in umsc so these are patients who had who had uh, given permission to to or to collect their samples for research so and and um, surgeries in umsc are done at eight o'clock at night or nine o'clock, whatever. So there was this, this uh, flexibility in terms of uh, their job time. But um, unfortunately, the technicians then went on to other jobs and now we have MLTs who are shared with um, other units and they follow a straight eight to five um, routine. So because of that, that doesn't gel so so well with uh, the reality of um, when operations are, are, are done. So, so that's, that's that. And the uh, dry ice machine, uh, we did toy with the idea with other uh, groups, including uh, Prof. IV Chung, et cetera, about having a dry ice machine. Um, but the, after doing the, mat, the mats, it, it was not cost effective. I think what your RAs um, need uh, is to maintain the temperature of the sample from our what is this um, two, uh, our tanks which are located at AEU and then bringing it to wherever. So it would be good if they didn't have to carry the vapor shipper around, or and and it's much easier to carry dry ice in a styrofoam box and then bring samples around. But we're not buying a dry ice machine because it's not not worth it. Yeah, I was just asking because that's that's the kind of uh, I thought it'll be good to have actual uh, people who are using the your your services to give me comments, and that's the comments from my RAs. So I thought I better share that with you. Uh, Prof, what, what about the tissue types? What, uh, because I've only used uh, brain tissue and uh, uh, blood. What about other tissue types? Can that be stored as well? Of course. As the, the only thing that, that uh, we, we don't want to, to keep or we are not allowed to keep are infectious material. Uh, these are the ones that, that, as you mentioned just now, um, probably BSL-3 labs who have that form of accreditation um, should should deal with this sort of infectious tissues. Having said that, these are patients who have no known um, infection. Um, of course, these there are some patients who might be Hep B positive or or have uh, most of us are CMV positive. These are not particularly uh, infectious per se to the point that uh, their samples will not be accepted. So. CSF, urine, uh, I remember last time Aisha gave us and wanted to give us nail clippings. Um, these are all, uh, they are all fine. Right. Uh, I think uh, Prof uh, YK is also asking about mix up of tissues. I think you've answered that before. If two containers are taken out at the same time and then replaced wrongly, what are the policies and rules to keep all these errors to a minimum? Okay, so there, there, there are other things um, that have been, uh, sorry, the errors, of course, we've, we've, we have several layers, as I said, of check and balance. Uh, and thus far, I think uh, since its inception in 2011, now this is uh, celebrating our decade of Biobank, there has never been a, a mistake. So, so or yeah. at least that's known to us. I think, I think you've answered that. Uh, Wei Hong is asking about what is your unit's cost recovery percentage? Wow, very technical. Don't know, cannot no. answer, sorry. All right. Okay, so, so oh, okay, so um, our patients, our Prof. IK also has asked, tissues going to the biobank, do you take their consent? The answer is of course. Mm -hmm. So all samples that are stored in biobank, before we even uh, embark on collecting, we insist that the project is uh, has has a ethics uh, number. So these are there's no such thing as collecting on the side, suka suka sort of thing. No, it doesn't happen. That's one. And the consent form. So all the consent forms. So there are two consent forms. One is a consent form 
to participate in the particular research project. And there's another consent form, which is the donation of the tissue to Biobank. And uh, so there's a, there's a little bit of a, a thin line here because if a person uh, donates the sample to Biobank, it is written in the consent form as a gift, gift to University Malaya. So the ownership of the tissue is not with the researcher anymore, but to Biobank. And, and all Biobanks in the world work in that manner. So it is an endowment to the, to the university. So uh, with that, subsequently, if we were to use that sample, for example, we, we have some commercial entities or other, for other um, researchers from outside who want the tissue, we will be able to aliquot some of this. Of course, we don't sell the tissue, I must underline that, but we sell the service, the service of storage, processing, etc. cetera. Um, Prof. April has asked about whether the, the impact of histological staging. This is also a very, very dangerous area. We have, um, I, I have met uh, Prof. Tan Su Yong, who runs the biobank in uh, Singapore. And he has told me about how a sample kept in biobank and then another bite was taken and sent to um, the pathology and, and this was uh, in a tumor. And the different bites showed that the area that was sent to pathology was um, mainly benign tissue and the one that was sent to biobank showed the malignancy. And it was only realized much later because um, the pathology turnaround time is much faster compared to the biobank creating slides, examining, reporting. So that led to a delay in diagnosis of a patient. So this must be all part of the, must be part of the uh, consenting, consenting uh, process. Uh, it, is, it is up to the surgeon to decide um, which part goes into biobank. So we, we, we cut the tissue, um, but there is, we used to have a pathologist, Prof. Tony Rhodes, who used to come and help us read off tissue to ensure QC how many percent necrosis, et cetera. But latterly, uh, we have been engaging the uh, services of uh, outside pathologists just to QC our tissue to make sure the HNE quality is good. We are not just keeping necrotic tissue, et cetera. How does... Uh, oh, sorry. Prof, Prof Hani, can I just add on to that? Yep. Uh, so uh, there was one occasion where I actually uh, sent a specimen to pathology lab as well as to biobank. And the pathology specimen was uh, necrotic tissue and inadequate to process. So I actually went back to Biobank and uh, requested that they, uh, I mean, I, I took the specimen out and sent it back to pathology to get a diagnosis. So we have done things like that. Uh, that's it. To answer Prof. April's uh, question, I think it's a bit difficult to say. Usually it's only big specimens. So if I'm doing a simple uh, biopsy, I frequently do not biobank it because I think the priority is the patient safety and patient diagnosis, not our research and not biobanking. So those kind of issues do not come to biobank. It's only when we think, uh, at least in the surgeon's mind, we think that we have got adequate tissue for uh, uh, diagnosis that we do biobanking, not when it's small tissues or when it's a simple biopsy, a stereotactic biopsy or something like that. Okay, so then um, let me see. That's uh, Prof. Prof. One, uh, Prof. April has asked about Umbi. Umbi is a completely different. It's a it's a it's a members compared to us. But with that also comes problems of sustainability. And uh, Umbi started with having um, funding because they were doing the simulation cohort, but. Um, the problem would be sustainability and uh, getting a con budget to, to continue. And a lot of, uh, like, for example, Singapore Tissue Network also had problems with that and eventually closed down. And so did the, I think uh, there, there was also another repository in London also closed down. Prof. Wan Arifin is asking about tissue from a minor, uh, less than age 18, so parents consent. Do you need to retake the consent after they have reached the age of consent, 
this has been uh, discussed uh, in uh, the ethics uh, during the during the time of uh, inception of biobank and the answer is no we don't have to because it is uh, anonymized and uh, we don't go back to to who owns the tissue in, in that sense contributing prof sara wants to give money to us uh, pay over time possibly if that is a very very precious tissue um, first case or, or, or one of the five cases in the whole world of course we we want to we want to um, help as much as possible uh, can negotiate paying over time why are why not our internal pathologies being engaged because our internal pathologies have repeatedly said no to helping out biobank even so the original plan was to for the sample to reach pathology and then when they when they do trimming they will then give us a small sample but what happened is the sample sat on a bench for hours and hours this was in the early days teasing problems with biobank so and meeting the various heads of pathology and they said that this was not a not a done thing so the only person that has actually helped Biobank in terms of helping to read slides QC was Prof Tony Rhodes. He was more of a researcher than a clinical pathologist. And subsequently, the, the um, outside pathologist um, does so for the for particular researchers who want their samples to be sent, uh, especially FFP slides. They want to send it across to a consortium that they are participating in. So we just need to QC the, the slides. Yes, yes, Prof. April, pathology is very short staffed and therefore completely agree. This is this is an, an ideal situation where we have lots of nitrogen tanks, a pathologist sitting in OT to do the trimming. Uh, that would be that would be ideal. But I must say. Uh, and not not because I want to praise myself. We I think we've done quite well given the many limitations that we have, revolving staff, uh, inadequate uh, infrastructure, etc. Okay, so if we reach nine o'clock, I'm sorry I, I I can't answer all the questions, but I hope uh, this session has been illuminating um, for for researchers. Um, it doesn't matter whether you are a, a just starting out or a big professor uh, do drop a email to biobank at um.edu.my and we'll try our best to support uh, your service it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, cancer related and as, as Prof. Arvin has shown he has moved from cancer to uh, trauma to even um, understanding uh, lipidomics and proteomics Okay, so thank you very much. And with that, um, I invite you to next week's uh, breakfast at UM Health. Thank you.